Good morning, this is Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer at the University of Kansas Health System. I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Dana Hawkinson. Yes, we did call him Hawkeye. So Dr. Hawkeye here in the Dolph uh, Simons Family Studio at the University of Kansas Health System. Good morning, Dana. How are Hi. things looking out there today? Hi. You know, uh, cautiously optimistic, but uh, the numbers for the health system are really pretty good right now. Um, 24 inpatients uh, with COVID-19. 11 of those patients are in the ICU. We have uh, another 13 that we are checking and ruling out uh, for the disease. So again, cautious optimism, but, but maybe our hospitalized numbers are going down and hopefully that's a reflection of possibly uh, total infections around the city going down. Always hard to know without more testing. Right. That got a right. lot of attention That's this weekend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's such a big deal. We also have a special guest today, Damien Stevens, a, a pulmonary critical care physician, one of my partners actually, who um, went out to New York and worked for a while in mm -hmm. New York City before returning. He's still on home quarantine uh, because you have to be for 14 days when you come back. Damien, are you on the line? Damien, are you on the line? We'll come back to him yeah. in just a minute and, and see. In the meantime, um, Damien, your thoughts regarding testing in Kansas and some of the things you're hearing out, out there about reopening and not about the political question of reopening, yeah. but how do we need to have testing positioned if we're going to do that? Yeah, testing is absolutely important. Um, so a lot of stuff has been gone about the antibody testing. I think before getting to that, we do have testing to look for the virus itself, and that's what we're using. It's a nucleic acid test, and it is very sensitive if done correctly. We've talked about this, and so it can really identify active cases for the most part. Um, I think that's extremely important so that we can identify active infection and try to keep those people self-quarantined or those households self-quarantined so we can stop um, further infections. The other testing is the serology or the antibody testing. And as you said, there has just been a lot in the news in the past week, and especially this weekend. Are the tests faulty? Do we have enough testing material? So those are all questions that we need to do, and certainly those need to ramp up. Certainly uh, Dr. Norman, Secretary Norman was speaking to that uh, on Friday as well. That's gonna be important uh, for several reasons. One, so we will actually hopefully know the prevalence uh, or the penetrance of the infection that has happened um, so far in the region. But those tests are also come with the caveats of are they sensitive enough, are they specific enough for this infection as compared to another normal coronavirus. And also, again, we still don't understand the immunology and how well you are protected once you do get the infection. Are you protected from getting reinfected? Are you protected from getting severe illness? We don't know that answer. We, we hope that in the next three to six months, maybe a year, you certainly would be. But moving forward, uh, coronaviruses overall have just proven very elusive for, for our immune system. Yeah, I think, and then we see it when it comes out in, in, in bigger um, uh, groups, like the meatpacking industry. Yeah. I know there's some there's uh, uh, that in, 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 in Wyandotte County, as well as in different parts of Kansas as well as um, uh, post-acute care units, yeah. nursing homes, churches, places where folks gather and have close contact, we've seen an ongoing issue. Any yeah. comments? Any yeah, comments about that? that is what we've always talked about. You know, we've talked about our most vulnerable populations, our older populations in the nursing home. But this also includes those other areas where people are gathered, such as workspaces, like the meatpacking plant, because these are our supply chains. These are what keep our stores running and our shelves stocked. So if a disease process is running through a nursing home where people are close together, it can very easily run through uh, things such as a meat packing plant where people are close together. And then that will really cause a problem if we don't open up in a um, very uh, uh, thoughtful, slow, thoughtful logical, manner yeah. because we, we really don't want our supply chains, our food, our necessities to be held back because people are ill and we just can't produce them. So that's another very important aspect to all this. Hey, Dr. Hawkinson, can I, can I jump in with a question? Hey, one, one second, please. First, I do want to turn to our guest because I think he's on the line. Damien Stevens, okay. pulmonary critical care doc here at KU. Spent a little time in New York working. Damien, um, you're, you're back. How are you feeling? Um, hey, thanks, Dr. Stein, for inviting me and Dr. Hawkinson. Yes, I'm still feeling fine. No fever, no cough. So, uh, 
been a week yet, so after one more week and a negative test, hopefully I'll be back there. Well, we hope so, too. Yeah. Tell us a little bit, what was your sense? How was it like being in New York, and what did you experience? It was just a completely different city. I've been a couple times in the last couple of years and used to, you know, everyone on the streets and uh, traffic, and it was basically a ghost town. There was very few people out, only the essential workers, and you would walk down the street and only cross a couple of people's path, but then you'd walk into a hospital and the front lobby of the, ho- lobby of the hospital would be packed, the ER was packed, the ICUs were packed, so it was really a, a city that was in kind of chaos in the medical system itself because they were just so overwhelmed. Talk a little bit about the conditions you were working in. The hospital I was working was in Queens. It was about a 450-bed hospital, and somewhere between 80, 90 percent of the hospital was COVID-related patients. And out of those, like I said, roughly between four, four, 350, 400 patients a day that were COVID positive, about 100 would be on a ventilator, and only about a half of those would even be in an ICU because they were so stretched that patients, there were no beds in ICU left. So they would be managing the ventilator, and we were converting PACUs, uh, you know, recovery units. Uh, ER was being converted rooms in the ER to, to be managed as the ICU beds. And the nursing staff, actually, if there was any need they, they had, it was even more for nurses, respiratory therapists, than even staff physicians. Do you think that as you reflect back on that, um, did you have a sense that the medical system was indeed overwhelmed in New York? You know, it was in different regions. You talk to different hospitals, um, and kind of the, the problem is, you know, one region, Queens, was hit very hard. Down. I was at a hospital that was just a couple miles from Elmhurst, which everyone in New York City called that, quote, ground zero, because that was basically the hardest hit area, and that was actually a smaller hospital and a city hospital. So in some ways, they were almost even hit worse because they even had less resources. <clears throat> the problem was the other hospitals um, would be awaiting their surge, so they would be reluctant to, you know, try to transfer patients from the hospitals that were overwhelmed because they didn't know if, you know, two days later, a week later, they were going to be in the same circumstance. And if they accepted, you know, dozens of patients from these other hospitals, would they themselves be overwhelmed? So then the Javits Center was being opened. Um, the ship, you know, was being going to be utilized. But then they would have very strict criteria on patients that they would accept and transfer. So in some ways, it was as much of a coordination issue of transferring patients to other facilities that maybe they would have a little better nurse-to-patient ratio. But it's so difficult in that scenario to, you know, kind of triage and coordinate when it's different cities, different health systems. And that was what I saw as, you know, kind of the biggest limitation, you know, to to delivering patient care is how do you coordinate that across such a large area with multiple health systems? You know, one last question, then we'll return to our media questions for today. Um, If I remember the nursing ratio in the ICU, typically between a nurse and a physician or a nurse and the patients is about one to one or sometimes two to one. What was the ratio like in New York with the nursing staff? It would depend on what floor there is. A, the, the lowest ratio I saw anywhere was about eight to one. And that would literally be eight patients on the ventilator, on pressors. Um, maybe for a shift or two, it'd be down to five or six to one. But there were patients on the floor that would easily be 10 to one. I just, um, yeah. It just, you know, with patients that uh, were not even, we had ran out of oximeters, so a patient that would be on the ventilator, and we didn't even have a good, easy way to con- continuously monitor their, their oxygen saturation. And like you said, you're, you're right, usually it's two to one, but sometimes when someone's critically ill and multiple medication for blood pressure or on a dialysis machine, it may even be one to one. But like I said, the lowest ratio I saw for an entire week was at least five to one. So quite often, myself, intern residents, we were drawing gases, we were adjusting the drips like manually ourselves because the nurse was kept busy simply going to the pharmacy, picking up medications and hanging them, and we would run the drips and draw labs, adjust the ventilators, do every bit of that ourselves. 
You know, I see nurses are a tough crowd. I just can't imagine yeah. having yes, uh, they are. Have them work in and, that condition. That's just, that's and, tough. And I can't second that more. You know, here we would round and be in the patient's room for 10, 15 minutes, but the nurses were in these rooms for 12-hour shifts, you know, and basically almost the entire shift, except if they were running to get medications, they were in the room with the patients. They were the ones that would bring the iPad to the room, um, you know, so the family could try to communicate because that's almost kind of the... The final sadness of the whole situation is I saw some patients that were married 30, 40 years, and we would transition to comfort measures, and the only way they had to say goodbye to family members would be through an iPad, since typically family members are not allowed into the room. Yeah, that That's just, as a critical care doc, that's just heartbreaking. I just, I can't yes. imagine the degree of difficulty and, and um, the strength of the nursing team who had to try and keep all that pulled together. Yes. All right, let's open up to questions from our media friends out there. Um, what we got? Yeah, this is Mike Cherry from KSPT. I'm wondering, okay, so once we have all these tests, um, and how do you then deploy them? I mean, is it random sampling? Do you have to show symptoms? Um, how do you decide who gets tested? Dana, let's, let's take on that one because that's a great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think initially um, there's going to be state health department ways to deploy there's going to be the health system ways to deploy and other local hospitals as well as we have more testing so it's test kits but it's also the swabs it's also the media those all of those things in the supply chain should be up and running so that you are able to more easily just as a physician order those probably with your health system or hospital but also now the health department um, maybe the county, but certainly the state health department is going to help coordinate their testing as well. So there are various means. You know, hopefully it's not going to be too unlike getting or having a, an influenza test ordered ultimately. Yeah, I think it needs to be in as many locations yeah. as possible, be readily accessible. And um, there's, t there's a great deal of talk about how that is going to get distributed across the state. And I would also point out that along with the testing, the other thing that's critically important is contact tracing. Once you get a positive test, what are you gonna do with it? If you're just gonna say, hey, I'm gonna tell a patient they're positive, that's, that's really only the first step. The thing that'll make the difference is our ability to trace who that person's been in contact with so that you can let those people know they need to stay sheltered in place until they can find out if they're gonna develop symptoms. And so I think it's really important to have the contact tracing. I know Kansas is trying to um, have um, uh, trying to find 400 additional people to come in and work with the state due to contact tracing in different counties. I know some of our medical students have volunteered. I think some of our nursing staff at Key are going to volunteer, and others are going to try and go out and help the state. So, I mean, this is a, an enormous undertaking, but I haven't met any part of COVID-19 that wasn't enormous because it changes our lives so much. This is just one more step in that change. But testing, contact tracing, and still, you know, it, it comes back to the basics. You, you know, I'm sure you're tired of us saying it, and yet you watch it out in public and people still don't do it. It's all about social distancing. That six-foot rule is a really, really, really big deal. Well, if you wash your hands, don't touch your face, cough. Cough into your elbow. I hope you just coughed into your elbow right there. All right. Next question. Hey, good morning. Hello, this um, is Amy this is Anderson. Go ahead. Well, this is John Pepitone over at Fox 4 News, and I just had a quick question about whether we know if COVID cases have actually peaked in the Kansas City area. Some are claiming that we've already seen our peak April 9th through the 11th. And if that's true, um, can you explain why we still need to maintain social distancing? We still need the stay-at-home orders in place. You bet. And so, if we haven't hit our peak, can you explain when we might or why that might be? You know, if you'll remember when we've talked about these different models, including the principal author of the model coming out of, of, of the University of Washington, which is referred to as the IHME model, um, he said it's a lot like forecasting the weather. That's about the degree of accuracy. Um, and then he actually went on to give another example or about trying to predict what's going to be popular and what, what's not on Netflix, kind of like Tiger King, right? I mean, who knew? 
But the, 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 so the IHME model moves around, and at one point it said it was going to be on April 17th, and then it was April 30th, and now it's April the 19th. So it, and the way they look at that is by, based upon the number of deaths. And the problem is that early in a disease course like this one, you haven't had an, this sounds terrible. Uh, what I'm about to say sounds ter terrible. It's mathematically correct, but it almost feels sinful to say it. You haven't had enough death to build the model correctly. And so um, it's still a large part of a guessing game. You know, at one point they thought it was going to be April the 14th, as I said. And then they moved it out to April 30th and May 1st. And then they moved it back. And it's all based upon how many deaths we're having and how those deaths are trending. Because there's a lot of variability from a day-to-day -day level on that, it, it can be a little bit hard to predict. Maybe it's a lot hard to predict. Other models have us peaking. Another uh, very um, uh, uh, um, commonly used one is the CHIME model out of the University of Pennsylvania. And, and those same investigators will tell you their model is only as good as the data that they have. And they had predicted that it was going to be closer to the end of May with uh, a lot more uh, deaths and, and bed utilization. I don't really know which one's right. You know, I'm the optimist, so I want to predict the IHME model is going to be correct. But that's just, that's just you know, that's optimism. That's not fact. And so what we have to do is take it day to day. And, and the reason nobody really knows is that we don't have a good value for how many people need, uh, have the disease in the community. And the reason we don't have that is we don't have testing. And you know you, 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 you hear everybody talking about there are these two different schools of thought. You can see them every time you read the paper or any other news source. You know, the, uh, there's a big group of folks out there who are saying we have to have more testing to open society. And there's another group saying, look, the economy's in desperate straits. We have to open up society. And, you know, I'm not a politician. And I'm not going to comment on the balance of those two points. What I can say is that if you open up society without testing, it is predicted in the Kansas City area that at least 95% of people have not had the coronavirus. Now, we don't really know. We're just using disease modeling to come up with that. But it doesn't really. I mean, if it's 80%, if it's 90%, if it's, if it's 95%, the majority of people have not had the virus, and so they're still susceptible to getting it. When you start opening up society and you don't do shelter in place, what changes? What changes is you have a lot more social contacts. Right. If you have a lot more social contacts and you're sick, and remember, most people don't know that they're sick in the initial phases, and kids may never know that they're sick. Young adults may never know that they're sick. They go out, they congregate, they're around others, and pretty soon the six-foot rule has become a one-foot rule. And, 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 and once that happens, when you go from six to one, then suddenly you're going to spread a lot more to a lot more to other folks, and then you're right back where you started. That's the challenge. The challenge is best mitigated by a strategy to test a lot of people so you can figure out what the real disease prevalence is. And if anybody has any minor symptoms, you, you test them, and you go back and you find the people they were in contact with, and you have those folks go back in isolation. That's the key. You find the people who a positive patient was in contact with, then you go back, you, get, you, you find those folks and you get them back into isolation so they can't infect others. That's what contact tracing is really all about. And that's why when we think about reopening society, we have to do it logically and thoughtfully and in a way that won't expose everybody back to more risk. Okay, Damien, that was my long thesis statement. Anything you wanna to add to that, Hawkeye? Uh, no, I think the answer to both of your questions about the economy and the testing is yes, and that's, that's the problem. Unfortunately, we know that this virus is so efficient at spreading and affecting other people. Um, if, if we were not to do it in a thoughtful, meticulous manner for opening up, you, again, you could get exponential growth, and then you could get, especially all of those populations, those special populations, those most vulnerable populations infected, and then we could just be back to our um, possible overwhelming of our health care system. And that's what we don't want to get. But we all need to do that. The economy does need to get back on. People need to get back to their jobs. But it has to be in a, in a thoughtful manner. So now I'm going to turn to Damien really quick, because this is a really important connection to make. And we, Damien, you were in a place that was, especially in many yeah. hospitals, were overwhelmed. As hard as people work, and as hard as the nursing team and the respiratory th team were working, do you think at an eight to one ratio or a one or two to one ratio, patients are safer and will have better outcomes? There's definitely some benefit of a lower ratio. I mean, there were patients that would literally be attached to oxygen on the wall oxygen device, and if they got detached, the patient may not even be uh, 
noticed for a while. So there's definitely some benefit. Now, the other big part of all this is we were enrolling multiple patients in different drug trials, because um, that's the one thing I have to say from my standpoint. After you know seeing so many patients for a week, we still and I would take kind of a informal poll of, of the doctors I worked with there. Several of you know already been there two, three, four weeks, and I said, you know, is there any guess of all these things we're doing what works best? And every single one of them acknowledged, I they just can't tell. So of all the things, I think that to reinforce from a purely medical standpoint, a physician standpoint is try to get patients in the trials so we at least learn from this because to a large degree we still are you know applying it day by day and don't have good in, in the pandemic that's what we're stuck with we don't know really what works to some degree until the dust is kind of settled and weeks months later so that was one of the big focus there is trying to roll as many patients as possible to drug trials yeah and when you're overwhelmed you're overwhelmed which means you yeah. just can't do the same work that you would otherwise do dana yeah and i'd yeah. like to add to that even though we have not been new york thank the lord um we have been very good for ppe we have not had a problem with ppe but what we have had a problem even though we haven't had that many patients here um, we have been close to drug shortages for simple medications to keep you comfortable on the vent and if you ever have been intubated or on the ventilator and you can't have these medications to keep you sedated and keep your pain down and you are on the vent or your loved one is, that's a very uncomfortable place to be. So even without being overwhelmed like New York, we have seen that we have been close to drug shortages for those other simple medications. Okay, next question. I just wanted to kind of, this is Amy with Channel 5, kind of circle back around on there are all these protests that are starting to pop up across the country um, with people wanting to get things open back up. And, you know, I understand what they're saying, but can you please speak to these people who might be considering heading out to a protest either here or somewhere else about the dangers of that and, and the dangers of opening back up too soon? I know you've touched on that already, but just kind of just a message um, to these these protests that are happening. You bet. Uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to do that again. I, th I know I did it last week, too. Dana, what are you doing right now? Right now, what are you doing? Um, I have You're alcohol gel hands. on my hands. Okay, Hawkeye. Purell, only whatever we, we put Rieger. in there. I think this is Rieger now. It's yeah. in the Purell thing. It actually, it smells pretty good. That Rieger stuff's pretty good. Um, I go to a large public gathering. I'm around a lot of people. Am I going to have this with me? Oh, maybe that I can pull my one out of my pocket. Where is that? Let's see. I've got both the, the the this one, and I got my I got my lotion to make sure my hands don't fall off and all my skin doesn't come come off. You know um, that works. And then and then I'm going to cough. I'm going to cough in my elbow. But the problem is when I'm in a large public gathering, I'm probably not six feet away. I'm, my wingspan's pretty 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 lanky here. I can almost fly away. I'm about as tall, and I'm six foot, and my, my wingspan's six foot. That's how far away I have to be from everybody. Am I going to be able to do that, do this, and cough in my elbow? Everything I'm supposed to do when I'm in a close public gathering. Oh, let's see. Did that work in the meatpacking plants? No. Did that, does that work in nursing homes? No. Did that work in churches where there are more, a lot of people? No. So here's the overwhelming evidence. Overwhelming evidence. If you're going to stay safe, you can't stay in a crowd. I, I mean, it's simple. So if you want to think about reopening society and you want to go out and you have a protest about it, can you think of a worse way to make your point mm -hmm. than to watch a lot of people get infected because they can't do this, they can't do this, and they don't do this, and suddenly a number of folks from that get infected? What is that going to do to the geopolit to the political thought What's that going to do to your state your case? It doesn't work so well, right? It really doesn't work well. So then how do you make your case? Well, we, we all feel it, right? I, I, our friends who are losing jobs, I mean, we're blessed. Dan and I are blessed yeah. to be here and work every day. But we know that a lot of folks aren't. But we all want to reopen society. How do we do it? You want to protest? Protest helping us get more, getting more tests. Protest our, our ability to do things to keep you safe. But don't do it in a mass gathering, because all you're going to do is make the point about how we can't open society. That's the mistake, because you can't do this, you can't do this, and you may not do this, and pretty soon you got a whole bunch of people who are sick. So 
Help us do the next right thing. Help us get more tests. Help us call attention to, to, to the need for taking care of people the right way so that we don't end up with an eight to 10 to one nursing ratio. That, that should scare you folks. I'm an ICU doctor. That puts chills in my heart. We, we, we can do better than that. So be smart, make good choices, do the next right thing. Anything, Dana, to that? Okay. Yeah, I agree. You know, we have touted being outside. We, we encourage you to be outside, but you have to do it in a healthy manner, a responsible manner. We've also said that this, uh, this virus is spreads on, on droplets, and the droplets fall to the ground. But when you are in such close proximity to other people, like, for instance, if you were walking on the streets of New York prior to all this, you're just bumping into people. You are around a lot of people. Those protests generally have a lot of people. So even if the droplets are falling to the ground, if you are sneezing and coughing, chances are, if you're close enough to that many people, it's probably going to land on some of those people. And, and you may just not even breathing may do it. And remember yeah. that people are asymptomatic for anywhere from one to five days and are still shedding the virus and still mm -hmm. infecting others. Yeah. So, you see, that's the struggle we're facing. Yeah, I'm, from my standpoint, I can answer that question with one simple sentence. The more prematurely we open, the more patients, people will die. Yeah. That, you know, if we think it's that worth that price to get the economy moving, to get, you know, people back to work and all that, and we do it too early, there will be more people die. It's as simple as that. Yeah, and I, and I think, Folks have to understand, people are trying to under, I mean, we worked all weekend on questions around how do you reopen the economy? How do you do it safely? Can we get more people out to testing? Let's gear up society. Those are the things we need to work together on. They said, if you want to protest, let, let's go talk about having our public health departments have the right staffing and the right things they need to do to keep people safe. Hey, Dr. Seitz, this is Mike from KCPD. When you mentioned 400 um, people going out, how do you how do you do human contact tra contact trace i mean we've heard all the things about using cell phones and things but how does that work um from a uh, a human to human standpoint you know that that is a great question we get in fact i'm i'm sitting here i i'm going to look at jill and i'm going to say we need to have one of our entire sessions we'll get some of our contact tracers in the public health department or lee norman on 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 this session because we can go through that in great detail because that's a great that is a great question Today, what folks do is they simply call you and they ask you, who have you been in contact with? And they try to get you to go through your memory, through your phone log, through your where you've been, look at your calendar, do whatever, and start thinking, okay, these are the things I've been, the people I've been around, and here's their identity. And then the person who's doing the con has to go out and contact those people, and sometimes the next order of contacts beyond that, Dana. Yeah, yeah, that's it. It's, it's a lot of uh, meticulous phone interviews. Where have you been? Who have you been in contact with? And then going to either those places of business or worship or wherever that person may have been, contacting um, the leadership there, and really trying to get a handle on who the initial patient was around. And it's just it's things of that nature. And it's a lot of um, footwork. It's a lot of time. It's, it's very intense to do that kind of thing. So you, do you, phone, you phone patients first? Yeah, though, when you find out you, you have a positive test, the first thing you have to do is inform that patient, and then and then you start asking them who they've been in contact with, where they've been, things like that. And it, and, and that's that is contact tracing, and it's not new to this disease. No. Just to be honest, in, in you know in tuberculosis or in the old influenza ap epidemic, you've heard us talk about uh, in 1918 and 1919. All the, I mean, contact tracing has been around for quite a long time. We've known how effective it is. We've known how, how effective social isolation, uh, I'm sorry, that sounds wrong, social, uh, social distancing and physical distancing is. Those are old infection control techniques. They've just been applied to this pandemic because we didn't have any other effective therapy. Well, I, I'm old, but I wasn't around in 1918. So. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, contact <laughs> I'm tracing almost is old enough. <laughs> For, uh, for various things, you know, we've had hepatitis A outbreaks, Chagall outbreaks. It's, it's, it's a very old concept, and it's done, you know, very frequently around around the nation. It's, it's yeah, and, and my point of being around is that I think it, it, this isn't, um, even in times in Europe and the Black, yeah. the black Death and different things, it, that, that is something that was applied. And, and it's what you do when you don't have an answer is you have to try and take more extreme measures to keep people safe. And, and so that's the whole social distancing and... and uh, shelter at home concept. If you knew it, so the difference between us and South Korea, South Korea went out and found all those folks and so they didn't have to close society as much. Without testing, 
you don't know who we and, and without enough people to do contact tracing um, what would happen is, and it takes hours for one person who is positive it takes hours of work to try and go research all that and um, as an example some of our local county health departments have two or four people to do contact tracing well you know you get 10 people positive in a day and that's that's you're overwhelmed there's 40 to 80 hours of work right there if not more and and so you just don't have enough bodies to do that there's just not enough people that's why they're trying to find all these additional folks to go out and, yeah. and help do that tracing yeah and you read about the contact tracing every day in the news you know it happened in South Korea with the two mass gatherings or congregations um, they've contact traced the some of the cases in the U.S. back to tourists from Europe, things of that nature. So those are the, those are what you read about every day. It's just not blatantly said these are contact tracing, but that's what was done. Okay. Next question. Hi, this is Nate with the health system. I've got a couple of questions here. Um, should a person with negative COVID testing still be quarantined? What was the possible? What's the possibility of a false negative testing? And also, can you speak to uh, the barrier testing, barrier to testing right now, and what is needed, and where can you get it? You bet. Let's start with the first part hey. of that, Dana. I think that's up your alley. Yeah, the testing is always important. We were talking about the antibody tests. Uh, you know, these are, are touted as the best thing. Well, there's a lot of caveats to those. What we know from now, from our uh, health system testing is that our sensitivity is about 95 percent so that means that we are going to pick up the disease the infection the virus if you have it so we are and that's on the swab confident. that's the standard yep. testing we do yep. today yep, yep. this is the swab for the nucleic acid so we are considering if that test is negative yes it's a negative test overall but, and then and then and then Nate re repeat your second part of that question But it should be stated that I don't know the specifics of the person that asked that question and all that. But in general, what I can say is our data from in-house is showing that our, our test is very sensitive. And the real key is it's the swab itself. Correctly. It's not, it's, the, the machine works great. If it's nucleic right. acid, it's probably going to find it. The problem is that the, the, test, the swab itself has to be done right. Mm -hmm. We've done retests on ours. Yeah. What, what is our data showing the retest? How do we do in terms of the positive and the negatives on that retest? Yeah, again, our, our data is pretty good. Uh, it's very good, actually. Those patients that tested negative were retested for one reason or another within, I think, at least seven days, and they were negative. And the patients that were tested positive were retested and were positive. And again, that's, I believe, on 50-some different tests, unique persons. And again, with based on that data, we're showing that we have 95% sensitivity. So it's a very good test. Okay. And just that other question that we asked, it uh, feels like a long time ago. What is the barrier to testing right now, and what is needed, and where can you get it? Yeah, I think the barrier is we don't have um, enough testing kits. We don't have enough swabs. Uh, you, you know, KDHE has been employing 3D printers from dental offices to try and make more swabs. Um, um, and, and, and others have been doing all sorts of novel ways to try and do it. But the swab isn't like a Q-tip swab. It's actually it's a biologic swab. It's designed to make sure it can trap particles on it, and then you get those particles into viral media. So the swabs that set themselves have been in short supply. Viral medium has been in short supply. And then the ability to process the test has been in short supply. All those are getting better. Um, because more and more of those testing uh, um, machines are available now, probably the rate limiting step at the moment is actually the swab itself, and then making sure that you have the ability to have all the throughput and get that, that test back over, uh, over to a lab to run it. Um, as tests escalate, and we think toward the end of May we'll be in pretty good position for testing, um, but we need more swabs and we're going to need more viral medium. Um, I think that's, those are two of the big rate limiting steps. And then having them um, distributed correctly around the state so everybody has easy access to it. We're going to have three guests on Thursday on testing. Okay, that's yeah, that's a good point. We do have a couple of folks, three folks, I guess, on on Thursday to visit with us further about testing. I, I, I think that's going to include uh, Fred Plapp, who's one of our, our leaders down in the lab, Rick Coldry, to whom they report, and is Rachel Leesman, who actually runs all of our equipment. Um, there are many unsung heroes around this world that don't get enough credit. Mm -hmm. The micro lab people, uh, I know ours, and I'm sure every health system feels the same. The micro lab people who, the ones who actually 
handle and process these tests and make sure machines stay uh, accurate are unsung heroes. And uh, um, Rachel Eastman, uh, I think, I'm pretty sure she walks on water right now around here. Other questions? Damien, as you came back to Kansas City, what was your biggest sense of relief? Realizing that we were not in that same predicament at this point, just because I think we, you know, learned what happened in Washington State and what had already occurred in New York City. So to some degree, and even in Europe, you know, that we uh, just so ahead of the curve kind of idea that because it was not, uh, you know, out of control to that degree and we had already practiced the distancing and uh, where we were aware of how bad it could be, and I think that was probably my biggest relief. Hey, Dr. Stites, I, I know we're over time, but um, you mentioned you were, you'll have some folks here on Thursday, but would you, could you all just go a little bit more and talk about the testing? I mean, is it really you just test folks who come in who think they might have it? I mean, I know there's some sort of civil liberty concerns here, but is there any talk of, you know, just random sampling to see who's got it, or do you just wait until someone comes in and is symptomatic? Yeah, so I think there's a lot of conversation around uh, random sampling to try to determine what the true prevalence or incidence is in the in the community. Um, there have been some samples. I think um, you might talk to the Johnson County Health Department. I think they've been working on some random sampling. I think others around have. Um, we haven't seen that data yet, uh, but that that is an important question um, to do that. And, and so, um, and, and people have to volunteer. You can't do it against their wish. So I, I think we're safe on the civil liberty part of that part of it, but that was the way you can try and find the real incidence of the disease that and doing the true contact tracing and, 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 and checking all, all those folks. So I do think there was a role from random testing, but you couldn't do that. That the problem was when we didn't have any testing kits or we didn't have enough testing ability, if you couldn't get the people in the hospital who are using up all your infectious control equipment and, and your PPE, um, because you, if you rule you quote rule them out, you say, okay, you're going to come in, you're a person under investigation, you're in that bed, everybody has to keep um, uh, keep going through all the PPE until we figure it out. And if you had to wait three, four, five, six, seven days, which was actually where we were before, now we're around 12 or 14 hours, but and sometimes faster than that. But um, when you're at four or five, six days and people are just sitting here waiting on a test result, even though they're sick, they need to be in the hospital. They don't need to be in isolation. And so you would burn through a great deal of, of equipment. I think we've moved past that phase by and large. I think we're now into a phase of making sure we get all the right people tested. We're still doing symptomatic ones. The next step is to start trying to figure out disease prevalence. With that, I think we're probably going to have to wrap up. And, and um, uh, these have been great questions this morning. We appreciate the opportunity to have this dialogue and visit with everybody because it helps us, and, and I think it helps hopefully keep people safe. Damon, any, any last thoughts before we go? Um, I just can't say it enough. Like you and Dr. Hawkinson said repeatedly, keep your distance, wash your hands, don't touch your face. Um, that just can't overstress the importance of that. And I do want to thank you and all the staff, my colleagues, and my, Dr. Castro, the head of my division, for allowing me to go and help out because everyone was very uh, generous in allowing me to go do that and covered for me here at Kansas City. So I do want to say thanks for that also. Well, thank you for the service that you provided to the folks in New York. It is one it is one world. So, yeah. they, or, Dr. Hawkins, and Hawkeye, anything else you want to add? Yeah, you know, I would like to say that our numbers look good right now. We don't know about the projections. Those numbers could change at the drop of a dime, the drop of a hat. Um, I think we need to restress again, if you don't believe the news reports, if you don't believe what actually is going on, we've had a, a great physician on today who was on the front lines and talking about the nursing ratio and the, the resources. You have to believe that we don't wanna become like New York. So I think continue to do what you're doing, social distancing, hand hygiene, coughing into your elbow, and let's try to keep those numbers down so that we can open up and get back to society and, and get to the restaurants and, and get work for our people. You know, I love New York City. Um, well, maybe not the Yankees, but, but or the Mets, but, but I love um, New York and going there. But this is not a part of New York we want to be like. Um, you've heard us say repeatedly, stay sa safe, shelter in place. And, and that's still really true. Against that is this rising fear and concern about the economy. 
And maybe our message has to be greater than that. Maybe it has to be work, stay, work safe, stay safe, stay home when you can. Because as we make that transition, we have to do it thoughtfully and logically. What we can't just do is reopen all at once. Because if we do that, we won't be safe. And then we're on the road to New York. Thank you all for your help today. We'll talk to you. We'll be back tomorrow. See you soon.